Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the professional development series here hosted by the Wayne State University Graduate School. My name is Nick Matar, and I am the Associate Director of Marketing in the Graduate School here at Wayne State. Um, this is our first uh, professional development series event in a couple of weeks. It's been almost a month now since we had our last session. Um, we took a short break for the Graduate Research Symposium, um, which if you haven't checked it out, you can still watch a lot of the sessions on YouTube. Um, and we also obviously took last week off uh, that coincided with spring break. So um, we do have two more events after today, um, next week and, and going into April. And those are both on um, a slightly different topic, uh, more about financial literacy, um, specifically on uh, credit scores, how, you know, how that impacts your life and how you can change it yourself. Uh, and then also one on securing your financial future. So those, those two events will wrap up the semester for us. But you can still go back and watch any of these current events uh, that we've had this semester, including the first part of this conflict management series um, that happened in February. These are actually on our new graduate school YouTube channel. Um, previously, we had just been uploading these to the Wayne State proper YouTube channel. Um, but we have now since started our own. So I recommend you check it out, make sure to subscribe so that you can see when these get uploaded. We'll still share the video clips once we upload them with everybody who's registered for the event or attended. Um, so you don't have to worry about never being able to see this stuff again. Uh, they will be available for you afterwards on demand. Um, and then the only other piece of housekeeping information is be sure to check out our, uh, our post-event surveys still. We've gotten some really good feedback so far from our attendees. Um, and they have been um, really, really strong. And, and we definitely take those into consideration here as we're planning for the fall semester. Our fall semester event series planning is going on right now. And now that we have cleared the 2022 research symposium, um, we're shifting our focus to the next semester and really the next full academic year of uh, PDS events. So um, also this morning and pre I think hopefully just now too, um, in the email that you received uh, with a link to this Zoom event, um, so too were the slides included with notes from the last session, uh, Conflict Management Part 1. Um, so check your email for that as well. Uh, but I don't wanna take any more time from our speaker today. I'd like to introduce once again, Dr. Laura Lee Keishley from uh, the College of Fine Performing and Communication Arts. She will be handling uh, her, her second go around here, Conflict Management Part Two. So mm -hmm. Laura Lee, if you'd like to go ahead and take it away, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Okay, just give me a moment, everybody. I'll share my screen. And let's go. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see, I recognize some of the names of you. So you were at my, the session that we had in February. So I'm really glad that you decided to return. As I was thinking about how to, and how, oh my goodness, my, um, my thing is being very sensitive today. I lean on it and it decides it's going to change. So um, clearly there's a possession thing going on here with my laptop. But as I was thinking about what I could offer you, because I think what happened in the first session for me was I gave you the, the skills model and an overall way of thinking about dealing with conflict. And that can be good with peers. It can also be good with supervisors, mentors, folks who are, quote, higher up uh, relative to you. And so I thought, what is it that I could add beyond that or that I think might be really useful to you, um, broadly speaking, but also when we're talking about working with faculty as supervisors and other kinds of folks. And so I actually went back into my <clears throat> archive and pulled out some information from, about setting expectations. One of the experiences that graduate schools have is when there are issues going, that are going on between a, a student or a postdoc and their faculty advisor is a recognition that many times the issues have to do with conflicting expectations. And that 
folks never really had that conversation initially and also throughout their working relationship as to what to expect from each other and what each of you would offer in that context. Now, some of you are familiar with some of it. You, you wanna be able to have talked about authorship on publications that would come out of your lab or your team uh, or in working with your advisor. Um, but there's other types of things as well about how it is we work together, what, what are the kinds of regularities in meeting, um, what are we looking for with the different kinds of activities we're doing. So I thought it was worthwhile to share that with you today. Um, and I am totally open to the fact that after we get through this and whatnot, you say, well, that didn't really hit it for me. And if not, you can always contact me. You see my email that right there. And I can help you think about some of the other um, some of the other ways to think about this. So let's get started. Um, so the objectives I have for today is to just set the stage a bit, the context. So what is the nature of conflict in grad education and professional development? Um, to talk about, and I did reference this in my prior presentation about an interest-based model of way of identifying what needs are at play, what your needs are, what the other person's needs are, and what are some of the ways to try to surface that and then try to find solutions that work for both of you or for all of you. And then to, sit, to look at it more explicitly and how in a more preventive way. So again, as I mentioned, sometimes conflicts are a result of mismatched expectations or assumptions, implicit expectations people have. And then once we clarify that the differences are due to expectations and we revise those expectations, people often don't have as many conflicts with uh, between students and faculty. So that's what we're gonna go with. A little bit of background here about why we should care about things like this and why grad schools care about this, but why you should care about it. What we know is that nationally, only about 60% of students entering terminal degree programs, in this case, PhD programs, complete their degree in 10 years. Um, and they've also identified differences between those who are early leavers or late and late leavers. So the early leavers are students, people who leave within two years. And the primary reason they leave is because of unmet expectations. So they entered the program with ideas uh, or uh, as a postdoc, you enter into the team and the kinds of research you wanna conduct and the people you're gonna work with, you had some assumptions, some ideas about what those were. And if those expectations are not met, this is not what I thought it was gonna be. This is not the kind of experience I wanted. People will leave. The late leavers after four or more years, uh, some of the, reasons people do that is the relationship with their faculty person, their advisor the, uh, of the team, um, and lack of departmental integration. So feeling like we're kind of on the outside of a lot of what's happening um, in our own department, the, the discipline that we're working in. So, you know, we want to be able to um, get those things clear. So, I mean, you all could probably identify with this. Why does the relationship between a graduate student and their faculty advisor, or faculty generally speaking, or between a postdoc and the faculty members that they work with, why does that relationship matter? Um, what are some of your thoughts about that? And you're perfectly welcome to, I can't see the chat. So, and we're a relatively small group. So if you wanna start out by just vocalizing it, just um, unmuting yourself and giving me some reasons, you feel that this, this relationship is a significant one. Anybody wanna do that? If well, they're, go, they're oh, training sorry. you how to function in your field. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep going, you're okay. I'm sorry if oh. I interrupted. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say that, like, you know, they're, they're sort of showing you the ropes and like how to behave ethically in some cases and setting expectations for um, what it's like, because like you're, you're watching them live their life because the, and so it's kind of like setting expectations for sort of how to conduct yourself with others, but also what your life is going to look like afterwards, yeah. if you go forward into your field. So it's a, in many ways, a professional socialization function and some anticipatory stuff for you. Like, is this the kind of, is this how I wanna work in, it, in the future? Is this what it's gonna look like for me in the future? That's a really good point. How about others? Other kinds of reasons that you could see that this relationship is very critical? Yeah, 
Yeah, Brim. I see you lit up, but you're muted. Oh, Sarah, I see your hand up. Go for it, Sarah. Um, yeah, I would say as far as like um, circle of influence and networking as well, I think it'd be very important because obviously they're established in a sector or an industry um, and an expertise on probably a fair amount of levels. So having access to learning from that and then also their network as well, I think would be very important because it could lead to future professional opportunity and, mm -hmm. and growth for you as well. And, you know, mutually. So that's right. So they can open doors for you by the same token, they could close them. Right. And they'll also be writing the letters that support any applications that you make. So all of that in terms of being able to make those connections um, and allowing you access to the kinds of networks they built up is really important, particularly when you're starting out. Anybody else, anything else that anybody wants to mention? I just wanna make sure you all have a chance. Two participants raised their hand. So I can, only, hold on a sec. Let me see who my second one is who raised their hand. Huh, that's interesting. I only see one hand. So who else has their hand up and wants to say something? Huh. Okay, it's messing with me. The system's messing with me telling me there's two. Well, those were really good, those were really good points that people made. So let's just look at so they're they're key to you because they mentor you in research, which is something that was initially mentioned. Um, you're actually going to continue to see these people, especially if you stay in the discipline or that particular profession, you're going to keep running into these people. So there's not, it's not just what's going to happen here, but ultimately you're going to continue to interact with them in some form or fashion. Talk about good letters of recommendation and faculty of power um, in relative to your experience while you're here. Um, they manage the stipends, they do the work assignments, they have resources and of course advice. Right, which was another point that people made. You want to be able to benefit from that. Um, and then the other thing, with, primarily for graduate students with dissertation committees, is there's a dependence on a small group of faculty, right? That they are the ones who provide guidance. And so you want to make sure you get good guidance. You want to make sure it's um, it is guidance that's timely, so that if you need to move in a different direction or to reframe something, you have time to do that. So it's clear that, that your relationship with faculty is important. Now, if you're in a relatively small discipline, right, um, that can create some issues for you if there's difficulties in the relationship between the two or the three, however many there are of you. Okay, come on now. So what we're gonna do, I've got a few little vignettes, little videos uh, that we're gonna look at throughout. I think I have four in total. Um, and I'm gonna be showing you two right now. And they're very brief, like anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute. And so what I'd like you to do as we approach these next two videos is I want you, as you're looking at each one, each vignette, what conflicts do you see there? What are, what is, what's going on in the conflict and how they're being handled. So you're gonna see one, maybe moment, the second one, and then we're gonna come back together and talk about the things that you observed. You ready? All right, let's go. Scott, I think this is great. This is ready for publication. That's great. I was just at the national conference and the editor of the Western Journal of Quantum Quality said we could have that out by June. The Western Journal of Quantum Quality? That would be a waste of a great article. Nothing from this lab has ever been printed in anything but a first-tier international journal. Dr. Modi, those things take forever. I need it out now for my job search. Not in that journal, not with my name on it, and not from this lab. Okay, that was our first vignette, so maybe you could jot down some of your thoughts. conflicts that you saw there, what do you see as it being in conflict, and what do you see as how it was handled? What types of things happen and how is it handled from your point of view? Louis? Well, I would say um, the issue oh, is- Oh, actually, Louis, 
can you just hang on just a sec? Because I'm going to, oh, well, actually, let me ask you all as a group, Louis, does it make sense that we process after each video? Because I was going to go video back to back, but what you're, actually, I like your idea better, Louis. So we're going to talk about that video we just went through and tell me about the conflicts you saw and how it was handled. So go for it, Louis. What, what did you, what did you track? There? Well, the student wanted one thing. He thinks that his research is ready. However, the advisor would in a way belittle him saying, no, I, I, we shouldn't do that and, and try and shut him down, try to stop him from exerting his own uh, influence, his own research out into the world or in, into the research, um, into academia itself. So I don't like the fact that um, an advisor would stop someone from mm -hmm. going onward with their own work. Mm -hmm. So, so I, the I, way that they came down and just said, not if not from my lab and not not in that journal and not from my lab right mm -hmm. and that that didn't seem to she didn't pursue any further discussion with yeah. the student about the about that and why he felt he needed it. great thanks louis how about others anything else you uh observed there or makes you think about graham if i pronounce that correctly graham i may not yeah you did it's okay um so I kind of saw it less as a issue of him, of her shutting him down as her not explaining the potential advantage of waiting to us to, or to try to publish it. Cause it sounded like she agreed with him that the paper was ready to publish, but just wanted him to go for a more prestigious, like yeah. paper with a longer processing time. Mm -hmm. And she very much like shut down and didn't listen to his, think about job searching and just shut him down instead of potentially explaining the potential advantages to him. Right. So she kind of like lost her role as a mentor to me. So like it, it would have been very easy if she had just sort of heard his needs and what he was expressing and said something along the lines of, you know, I hear you and you want this for your job search, but if you put it in a more prestigious journal, A, like it'll help you in the long term um, with your CV. And also you can just for your job search say like under review and right. it'll count the same as if it was already published. So there were a lot of ways around that. And she just sort of focused on herself and her expectations instead of taking his feelings into account. Okay. So there was information that you think could have been shared there. Um, and act, you know, it actually what it's about is getting to what it is that's important to people in those situations. So what was important to her and why would she make a statement that says, not that journal, not this lab, there's stuff going on there that, she, that and you've been um, thoughtful in terms of what that potentially might be. Um, and then also what the students needs were. So. Those are really good observations too. Anybody else have anything they wanted to say uh, commenting on that? I think it's just kind of piggyback offing what's already been said, but like the being receptive to the feedback on both ends, I think would be more helpful. So, you know, kind of finding that common ground, adjusting the expectation, um, maybe not taking the criticism or the feedback as, as uh, negative, but as constructive, I, I think that that would help the situation. Right. And that's ultimately what this whole presentation is about. <laughs> you just summarized it beautifully in a nutshell, which is, there's, I mean, there is a, another level here about, did they never have a discussion about what would be the, you know, the best venues for journals, that type of discussion. It seems like both of them were somewhat surprised that the other one didn't know something. Okay. So let's go, oops, no, we did that one. Stop that one. There we go, here's another one. I'm not gonna write this dissertation for you. I've given you my comments, but the task is yours, not mine. I don't think you're giving me clear enough direction. There is no magic checklist. Okay, so what what did you see there? What what? What's the current leadership? Her le <laughs> no, I mean, it really is. You're giving me, you're, you're telling me what's required, but you're not giving me instruction or any kind of guidance. Mm -hmm. So that's from the student's perspective. 
what about what do you hear the faculty member, the advisor say? Sarah, you don't have to be the only one who answers. Oh, I'll say you're it. Welcome. Oh, you're welcome I mean, too. You're welcome. <laughs> from from I guess from the faculty's point of view, it's that okay, you're not listening or you know, I'm not holding your hand. You've got to take the initiative. You've got to be proactive and show me, you know, what you've got. So mm -hmm. I think to them, it's the excuses, like the student may be making excuses from the faculty's point of view. Right. But again, articulating it differently could help them find some common ground. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to make an observation about that? That was, you know, that I think that was quite accurate in terms of the kinds of behaviors we saw. And one of the things you see us doing, like with this previous one, the previous video, and this vignette, is we're trying to think about why would somebody say what they said? What is it that they're trying to do? What is it that they want to accomplish? And what we're essentially doing when, if stop that, we don't need you again. What we're essentially doing is we're getting into, and we've just done this, we're getting into um, getting at people's interests. So we're, I'm, what I'm doing here is laying the groundwork for thinking about what is it that people need? And they're providing solutions like not in that journal, not from this lab, or um, you know, it having to be, I need more guidance, or there's no magic wand. Those are all position statements, but what are they trying to address? And what's been interesting as all of you have spoken is that you're trying to figure that out, which is exactly what we need to be doing in conflict. We need to be trying to figure that out. And when we're in conflict with somebody else, who's the one who's gonna know the most about what the other person needs and is thinking about? That other person, right? So we need to be clear about what we understand we're trying to accomplish, what our needs are, and then also trying to learn what the other person's interests are. And usually when we do that, get to that level, it starts to reveal possibilities for us. Um, so thinking about your own experiences, resolving when conflicts were resolved well, what was involved? And you, I, I hope every one of you has had an experience where a conflict was well resolved. In thinking about that, give me at least one thing that you felt was involved that made that conflict management go well. Ownership. Ownership. Okay. So, so this is actually directly related to the video that I just saw that is actually something that I had to work on personally when it came to dealing with conflict and fixing this has really helped me. But when he was talking to her, he used kind of like, and I, don't, I forgot the word for it, but like he used kind of extreme language. He said, there's no magic bullet. And so in that way, it's completely like, it, it, it sort of like completely invalidated her and made it seem like she was asking for something that was like completely out of the realm of possibility. Oh. And so kind of like watching the language that you use and trying not to like blow the other person completely yeah. out of the water with extreme extremist language is something that I found really helpful. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we will often do is we are making decisions about things based on what we're seeing across the table in an example like this. So he, the that advisor interpreted her request for more guidance to mean something other than what she had interpreted. And he gave it, as you point out, Graham, a fairly extreme interpretation, but that may not be what she was, that may not be the core piece of it. And you're right that that kind of language can be belittling, right? It's very dismissive. So it sounds like when conflicts have gone well from your point of view, managed well, you feel heard, you feel someone has worked to understand what's important to you and what you are, are wanting to communicate and what you're trying to achieve. And you didn't see that in either one of these scenarios. Now, somebody had their hand up. Candace, I think you, I think it was Candace. Just I did, but you sort of touched on it. Um, what I was going to say is I think both parties have to be willing to seek a resolution because yeah. sometimes you can get into these um, discussions where you're trying to resolve an issue, but neither, you just want your point heard. You're not interested in actually continuing the relationship or um, truly seeking reconciliation. Um, yeah. And so I think that's a, a big thing I've noticed that yeah. that has yeah. to be there. 
Yeah, I mean, pe we, we need people to be motivated. I'm seeing one of my colleagues, uh, Barbara Jones, um, in the audience. And Barbara's a very experienced dispute resolution practitioner and also a mediator. And Barbara, you and I know that um, in order for mediation to be the most effective, people have to be willing to want to find a, a solution that meets people's needs. Shiba. I see your hand and I think you're still muted. So if you want to talk, please unmute yourself. Sheba. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, Sheba, but I don't, you seem to be still muted. And so if there's something you want to say, please unmute yourself. Okay. Well, Sheba, when that happens, just let me know. All right, so now let's go on a little bit here. Got a nice animation for you. Um, I'm a big fan of dealing with things earlier on than later. And the reason I'm a big, there's a number of reasons I'm a big fan for that. So when the fir first time things start to show up is when I wanna start having some kind of conversation about it and talking about it. Um, and part of that is because over time, and as a conflict progresses, the options that are now available to, to solve that situation become less. They, you get fewer and fewer. And often, especially if a conflict has escalated, now you have additional issues, right, that show up. How people feel they've been treated. Other kinds of issues didn't get resolved. And so we, we want to be able to manage those early on as soon as we possibly can, having those conversations. That, so that's another reason why setting expectations at the beginning of the relationship, but also throughout, can help keep as many options as possible open. All right. We never want to get to the point where it is so advanced that there is no opportunity. So I just want to, oh, I hear somebody. Has somebody got a little one with them? Because uh, they're off mute. Um, so they're, whoever's got their, <laughs> hey, Nick or um, Mary, could you mute the person? Because they're busy with something right now. Yes, I, I took care of it, Laura Lee. Okay, thank you. Um, the strategies to address conflict. So there are a number of different ways we could do that. Um, but four really ways that we think about it are by avoiding it. And we talked about that in the last session, right? That there are times when avoiding a conflict makes sense. In this kind of relationship that you're in, in the long term, avoiding it is not a good idea. And you already mentioned some of the reasons why you wouldn't want a disrupted relationship with your advisor um, or your mentor because of the kinds of access to resources. Another is the accommodating strategy, which is where you give in. And again, last time we talked about there are times when that makes complete sense, like when the other person is right, or it's more important to them. And for you on this particular issue, you're like, you know what, I can kind of go either way. So if it's important to them, I'm going to do that. Long-term strategy? No, not particularly if you are developing and you are developing yourselves as your own independent professionals, academicians and whatnot, you need to be able to feel that you can be assertive and get your needs met, or it's gonna become incredibly frustrating. There's the, there's the positional strategy, and I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, um, where essentially people figure they've already solved it. So they put things out like and say things like, I can't give you any guidance. There's no guidance to give you. There's no magic bullet. That's a position. The question is, what is that position trying to resolve? What is it trying to solve? So the approach we want to go with is interest-based, or the other way to think of interest is what is the why? What's, what, is, what are people's needs? So I'm going to give you another vignette, all right? And we're going to take this one and we're going to work it through the model. So just take a moment um, to watch this and see what you think. So what's happening? Well, I would like to talk to Dr. Roberts about taking Dr. Black's place on my committee. Why would you want to make a change? Well, I've been finding it really difficult to work with Dr. Black. And I've had several classes with Dr. Roberts, and I've had really good experiences in them. Well, I, I don't know 
I don't think you should really base your decision just on the coursework. The reason I pushed Dr. Black for your committee is that he is really an expert in your research area. I know he can be a real bear to work with. You may, you may find him cantankerous, but I think in the long run, he's going to be the best person. I really can't see changing at this point. What about how I feel about the committee? Okay. <laughs> so, first of all, what are your thoughts about what you just saw? How do you think that was handled? What do you think the issues are? Aside from the sort of the body language that he was putting <laughs> out, it was like he explained his position well and he explained like why the decision was made and what potential benefits could happen from the situation. So she was giving a little pushback, but he was much better at explaining why than the previous example we've seen, but the body language was a bit iffy. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. I think that's, I think for me, I, I see that same kind of thing that you're talking about, Graham, which is that he provided information about why he would not want to have to switch somebody out on the committee. And the student in an assertive way, and we talked about this last time, in an assertive way said, but what about what I need? And so that's an, also an invitation, hopefully for this conversation to continue. So let's just, I just wanna review what the positional response approach is and see um, and how we can get to the level of needs. So I've got a chat thing in my way. So in a, a position is essentially a claim that makes to answer some kind of immediate question. So the question here is about, the, is so what is it? Come on now. So here's a position. I want Dr. Roberts on my committee. Mommy. Hey, Sheba's little one. <laughs> I want Dr. Roberts. That's a, that's a position. That's a solution to some kind of issue. Or come on now. I don't want Dr. Black on my committee. Right? And another position might be you will defend in winter of 2022. So those are some kinds of claim that answers some kind of question. What we have to figure, what we have to learn about in a conflict with somebody else, or if you're helping somebody, somebody's work through their conflict is what is the question that they're trying to address? What are they trying to do? Um, so one of the downsides of the a positional approach is now we've moved from having multiple options to have trying to narrow it down to almost two kinds of positions. And neither one of them may be the best way. Either Dr. Roberts is on or he's not on. Either Dr. Black is off or he's not off. Um, and people can then feel, if they only feel they have that, those are the only choices, then that can be a problem, right? Because somebody's not going to win someone will lose and it could potentially harm the relationship. So when we think about conflicts, so these are things that have occurred. Um, this is how we work about resolving them. We understand the nature of the context. So this is a relationship with this last one, a relationship between a faculty advisor and a student, um, their dissertation advisor and a student and what that relationship has been like. There's a concern that they have. There's some kind of question that she's trying to answer. The question she's trying to answer has to do with her committee and getting the best kind of support she possibly can. Underlying, so underlying that is more the interest. It's hard for me to stay at the level of issues because I've done interest for so long. And then once we get to interests, we can look at identifying, okay, if these are what the two of them are really looking for, what they want to address, what are a variety of different ways that we can address that. And then let's assess which of these various ways might be the most effective way to do it. And let's do it together. In expectations, what we're making sure is to talk about what people's needs are upfront before the issue, something even becomes an issue. So conversations about the dissertation committee, I know when I have uh, been, a, 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 I'm a dissertation advisor. 
Um, and when I've done that, the student and I have spent time before we structure the committee saying, what are the kinds of things we need? What is the expertise? What are your thoughts? I asked the student, what are your thoughts? Who are some of the faculty that you find interesting and what do you think they would bring to it? I talk about what I think they might bring to it. We talk about what's needed and figure, out, and figure that out together. So we get to our interests and then we can start working on those kinds of issues. So one of my experiences helping people work in conflict is many times the big challenge is identifying what the issue is. And when we actually figure out together what the issue is, sometimes the resolution becomes very quick, very quickly, because now we have a shared understanding of the nature of the problem. So when we're identifying the issue, what we're asking as we see these vignettes is what's the question? What's being asked here? What is the issue? So it's an issue is the immediate question for which you need that answer. Now, it may not be the only basis for conflict, but it's, it's what's grabbing people's attention now. So question here is who should be on my committee? Or when you're talking to your advisor and I've been with, I've been around with this with both my advisees, but also being a committee member about when they defend their dissertation which is a really important discussion to have fairly early on and revisit periodically, because otherwise it can fester. And both parties for an effective management of the issue of the conflict, both parties have to agree what the issue is. So that involves a conversation, right? What is it that's important? What is it that you need? And how can we best go about getting that? So here's just another way of thinking about interests. My favorite way to think about it is as a need. Something that has to be satisfied um, is what people's interests are. And a positional approach has them already having created a solution to some kind of need, i.e. their interest. So we're trying to figure out what that is. So for example, in this situation, um, a core need is that the research is, is excellent. Right? We, we develop committees, we want people to have expertise on that to facilitate the growth of the student. And the student wants to benefit from other people's knowledge and experience. Come on now. Um, there's an issue here of authority. Who has the authority to make this decision? Is it a shared one? Is it the advisor's authority? Um, we want to, they want to make sure they continue with good working relationships. Right. That was an issue that came up for the student that Dr. Black was a challenge to work with. And it's something the advisor recognized that he that Dr. Black is a challenging individual. So good working relationships is a question on the table. Uh, being able to do self-determination, the student is saying, but what about what I want? So yes, advisor, it's important and your rationale and makes sense to me. I also have some, I also have needs, I also have. Uh, issues that I want to address. And timeliness of completion, getting this done, right? So those are some examples of the kinds of interests and self-esteem too. If, you, if any of you have ever had the experience, and I've been on committees where there have been sometimes faculty who are, for lack of a better word, very difficult, um, don't deliver feedback well, um, can even be perceived as being attacking, and also students on the other side of that too. And so people want to feel good about themselves. They want to feel good about what they've accomplished. So that sense that you're competent and able to do this, both on the part of the student, but also on the part of the faculty member or the advisor. So, so op options, you guys know what options are. There are alternatives or different ways that we can address that question that we can get an, an answer to that immediate question. And so one of the best ways to do that and Graham pointed this out, <laughs> people have to want to work on it. So I'm making an assumption here that the, in this, that last vignette, the advisor and the student want to work something out together. They want to figure it out together. So being clear about what it is they're trying to accomplish, what needs they're trying to address, the two of them could develop a number of different options. Um, and so, with those kinds of options, then you end up, you can take that set of solutions and figure out which one of these options best addresses what we said the issue is. 
what we said the problem is. So if it's research excellence, what are, who would be the best compilation of people on the committee while we also recognize the self-determination of the student and the need for co good quality working relationships. Sometimes these, these interests can be brought together. It doesn't have to be an either or, so it's not a but situation. It's either research excellence or, or a good working relationship. It can be research excellence and a good working relationship. And what are the options that will facilitate that? So here's another nice graphic for you. So we have our issue defined. And then in the conversation, the question we're trying to ask, we have identify what are the needs that people are trying to make. So we talked about research excellence. We talked about self-esteem. We talked about self-determination. We talked about good working relationships. And then there are the different kinds of options. We brainstorm them. And one of the key things when you brainstorm is your very first stage is you don't, as you, is get the ideas out without judgment, without evaluation. So someone might say, well, we could add another member to the committee. And the other person goes, no, we can't do that. The grad school won't let us do it. No, that's not the time to do that kind of evaluation. We just need to get out all of the possible options. And then when you've got all those options, and you know what you're, the questions you're trying to address, what the question is and what are the interests underlying it, then you can actually take each of these options and say, okay, what does this one address? Does it address the issue of work, research excellence? Does it address the issue of um, self-determination? Does it address, and you can see from this graphic that some of these don't work at all, uh, but others of them do pick up on certain things. Right, And what's really powerful about going through this is yes, you will come up with a solution, um, but it's the process of engaging with the other person in this conversation that I think is the most powerful thing. Because now the two of you are looking at the issue side by side, as opposed to being confrontational and across from each other and seeing each other as being the issue, but that there are other things in place. I'm just going to check my an hour is never enough time you guys never enough time okay enough with the graphic okay g isn't a good one so we're getting rid of it <laughs> so that's the overall model of it how to do that um it's e it's relatively easy to understand but it's sometimes hard to do why do you think it might be hard to do anybody got any ideas about why it might be hard to do or maybe it doesn't feel hard to you. Maybe that's what you already do, or you can see how you could use it. We tend to personalize things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough in conflicts not to feel defensive, not to feel like it's an attack on the person. And depending on the language the other person is using, as Brown pointed out, it can feel like an attack. Um, and when people are being defensive, the person on the other side can also feel like the defensiveness is an attack. Right. So at a time when we desperately need to be able to kind of take a deep breath, slow it down and say, you know, let's look at this. That's one of the reasons I like this interest-based approach because it's very compatible with how many of us um, work in developing our research ideas and gathering data and testing things out. So it's a very familiar analytic strategy that we have here at the university. So we actually, you actually have a lot of skills in this asking you to do, and I'm asking your advisors to do, because we do presentations like this for advisors too, is to utilize some of that skill that you have about how we parse things out and how we get at what the underlying issues are. Um, so we're trained to be solution oriented. So what I'm asking you to do is back off the solution, uh, which I think is potentially premature and understand what it is you're trying to solve. Because sometimes the two of you are trying to solve different things. And we need to get clear about what is that question, your questions you're trying to address. Um, we also get rewarded for defending our solutions, right? I mean, that's how we win prizes. That's how we get things published. Um, that's how a dissertation defense works, right? Because your dissertation is a solution to some kind of pressing issues. Um, so some say it's against our nature. I don't like using the word nature too much because it sounds like it's saying it's immutable. 
but we've already heard from one of the uh, audience members that they've already been doing some of their own thinking and training in conflict resolution, and they're finding that they're doing things a bit differently. So against our nature, mm, it may be unfamiliar to what we've typically done, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. Defensiveness, which was brought up, sometimes strong emotions are triggered. So sometimes when we're working in a conflict, we are going to need to take some time to slow it down and to deal with the strong emotions. So we can we step away from the specific issue and say, okay, we need to we need to work with this right now. You're really upset right now. Let's talk about that. Or I'm feeling really, I'm feeling very anxious about this. I'm feeling very worried about it. You're my faculty advisor and you seem to be really upset with me. And what does that mean? We need to be able to stop and work that particular issue. And then we can come back into the broader one. And many of our expectations are implicit. So what we think is the appropriate journal, what we think is the kind of expertise we need on the committee, what we think, how we should engage around uh, how we should engage around conflicts. People often, their conflicts sometimes are often about how they conflict. Um, so some folks come from places where you don't deal with it uh, right directly, you have to come at it through another way and that's completely appropriate for them. But somebody else may be about, I'm just really blunt, I just put it out there, I just do all of that kind of stuff. You put those kinds of different styles together and people are like, I don't know what just happened here. And they get really frustrated with each other, but it's never, it's not about the issues or what's between them. It more has to do with, they have different ways of doing it and they never talked about how to do it. Again, one of the things I do with my students, both at the beginning of our relationship, but throughout, is we talk about conflict. And we talk about potential sources of conflict between us, how we each feel about conflict, what are some of the challenges we face in dealing with, what are some of the strengths. And then we figure out together how, knowing what we know about each other, how it is we might, how we want to approach, best approach each other when there's an issue that we need to discuss. So implicit expectations are all those, what didn't you understand about what I didn't tell you? Oh, Kim's got her hand up. Yeah, Kim. I got a quick question. So sure. I'm listening to you and I'm wondering how do you, because I find myself when I'm dealing with uh, mentors mm -hmm. where I know, I know what I need or I'm looking for when I see it, but I don't know how to convey it to get where I'm trying to go. Okay. And then when you're trying to get the person to, and when they're giving you the feedback, it doesn't feel right. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Or it does, your, like your gut feeling doesn't say, okay, that's what it is. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And then you kind of give that feedback and try to explain. How do you deal with that kind of situation? I guess I, okay. I hope I didn't misunderstand the last bullet point when it says sometimes our expectations is, is explicit of what it is that we're thinking of. Because right. that's the scenario that I thought of. Yeah, actually, that's a different kind of issue, but I think it's an important one that you just raised. And what I hear you, what I hear in what you say, you, you're saying, Kim, is how do you put into words, how do you understand what sometimes your own reaction is like? You have this gut feeling like this isn't going well, or this, you know, how do I, I don't know exactly what the issue is, or I don't know exactly what that's about. Is, would that be a fair characterization, Kim? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So Kim, and I remember you from the last session too, because you always ask really cool questions. Um, when the best thing the other person can do in that situation, especially if you feel like this is a good relationship to hang out in and to work on, is they need to help create the space and they need to listen to you. So I know that I, there have been times when students have said to me, and, and I, I'm perfectly open to this and we talk about it in our expectations. And, um, I'm not exactly sure what's wrong, but something doesn't feel right to me. And I'll say, okay, tell me what that feels like. Tell me what it's about. And then we start talking and I listen. I listen. Yeah. Okay, somebody's still unmuted. If they could mute themselves, thank you. Um, so that we often take time out and say, okay, let's let's try to figure out 
what it is you're experiencing, what I'm experiencing, and get clear about that. So often we'll step away from that issue, but we focus on the issue about getting clear. And one of the best ways we can help people get clear is by listening carefully to them. So having them talk, be willing to share, and listening very carefully, and all those wonderful active listening skills that we, we talked about in the last session. Is that helpful at all to you, Kim? Yes, it is. It, it, it puts things into perspective. So okay. for me, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and I'm aware of the time. So the explicit expectations are things that we say explicitly, we make it clear, and then sometimes we put it in written form, right? Um, our policies, like grad school policies about what to do in these situations and all of that stuff, that's a written set of expectations. So there, there are ways we can just be really explicit um, and no, somehow note it down so that we have a shared understanding of that. And then it's important to check it out. So you know, uh, being able to say, so as I understand it, the most appropriate journals or the journals that you feel are the most appropriate for the kind of work we're doing are these type, these ones in tier one and whatever. Is that, is that right? Which is what? That's your listening skill, right? You're checking back for understanding. And again, like I said, this, this um, kind of session that we're doing with you, we also do this with advisors because I know there are faculty who could really benefit from taking on these kinds of models and thinking more carefully about them. Um, explicit expectations can be formed unilaterally, which is you, you, make, a, you make an explicit statement. Um, this is one of the things I've, I've encouraged students to do with me um, is they, they, usually what comes up very early on is how often they want to meet with me. So they'll first usually ask me things like, how often should I meet with you? And I, my response is, I'm gonna let you drive that question. What works best for you? How often would you like to meet with me? And I'll say, you know, these things do change over time. So what we start out with our meeting schedule, may you may find over time that, hey, I don't need to meet as often or I need to meet more often. So for example, with the students that I work with, a lot of their first year or so is all on coursework. And so they're just wanting to check in and, you know, update me. And so I follow their lead on that. But then as they start working on their research, I, you know, some of them say, I need to meet more regularly. I need to seek your guidance and stuff. And, and I go, okay, we can do that. We can totally do that. So, you know, setting out the expectations. Now, sometimes we do it unilaterally. Um, you know, the grad school makes it very explicit what's required for a dissertation, what the format is, what all of that is. That's a very explicit set of expectations. Now, typically, when we think about negotiable expect expectations, we can think about it this way. We want to have more explicit expectations, which really means you need to be talking to the other person more frequently and about these kinds of issues, about the expectations you each have. Um, and know that, too, throughout the relationship, the working relationship you have, those may change over time. So you need to revisit those. Um, so that's, I'm gonna stop that there because we're getting close to our time and I wanna make sure that um, we have some time to chat. You again will have this PowerPoint. I will augment uh, the notes section, provide additional resources for you. And of course, I'm always available to you. So if there's things that you wanna talk about, you don't wanna talk about at this moment, but you wanna talk about later, you're totally welcome to contact me. I'll put my email in the in the chat. And any burning questions right now? Marley, it looks like we had a question from Sarah. Okay. That's what good. about being solution agnostic earlier on? Solution agnostic. Sarah, say a little more about what you mean by solution agnostic. Um, I think like, you know, if you're looking for some common ground mm -hmm. and you're not committed to one path or one journey, uh -huh. um, is that beneficial? Does it, or does it really create, does it create an inroad to finding that or does it kind of lose direction? I guess is what I would say. Well, my first thought is I listened to you 
talk about that, Sarah, is that actually a piece that I didn't mention is when you do identify an option or options to address the, the needs that people have been able to get clear about, that you also revisit that option. Okay. And so you say, okay, why don't we try running with that? You okay with that? Why don't we try running with that? And let's make sure we check back in. And I, again, being explicit, let's make sure we check in a couple of months, a couple of weeks, would that make sense or a month or whatever? Uh, does that make sense? So that we're willing to kind of test out what the solution is. Um, because sometimes the solution we've chosen for that moment, we try it out and we go, mm, that didn't quite do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, and that's useful information for us too. What part of it worked, what part of it didn't, has the issue changed, that kind of thing. Is, is that helpful, Sarah? Yes, thank you. Could I ask a, a follow-up question to that? If it's a relatively short one, because I got <laughs> for you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so say you had you come to an agreement moving forward, and then somewhere down the line, it falls apart. And then that's where the conflict is, is where you've had this understanding, you have the agreement and things are going in a momentum. And then there's this abrupt shift that is unexplainable for whatever reason. How do you deal with that conflict? You get back together with the person and say, you know, last time we spoke, we agreed we would do this. And so things have moved along and now it's stopped. And I, I need to, I need to understand why. Do you see that? Do you see that it stopped or it changed somehow? And then you're opening up the door then to talk about what might have happened. And someone might have made a unilateral decision at that point. And you're like, okay, we need to talk about that, <laughs> right? How that was handled and how that decision was made. Or someone might have said, yeah, we went with the solution, but it wasn't working. So I needed to pivot quickly and I, and I did this. Okay, let's talk about what that pivoting was like and what happened. And then I think there's a broader question here about once you look at that part is thinking, stopping and saying, okay, in the future, when something we agreed to looks like it needs to change, I need, I want to be involved with that. Just like I want, I want us to talk about that beforehand. So what are things that we could do? Is that something that you want? Yeah, I would have liked that. Okay, what are ways if we need to make fast pivots? Um, you needed to get a hold of me really quickly. Let's think about some of the ways that that could happen. You know, that kind of thing. So it's not unusual for that to happen. Great, thank you. I, I just encourage you not to give up, <laughs> right? Oh, damn, you know, I we put that in place and then they just change their mind. Oh, that's just, the way, you know, and then it goes all the way off. And again, what you're doing is inferring what the other person's motives and interests were. And they're the ones who typically know. But you're also being assertive and claiming your space in that relationship to say, you know, this is something we define and work on together. Brent, Great, thank you. You're welcome, Sarah. Um, hi, Lori. I might need to just send you an email about this because I think I have several questions we don't have okay. time for. But okay. I guess my initial question would be like, how do you deal with someone, particularly someone who has like power over you? Mm who doesn't see who like and I guess it's an accountability issue but who like doesn't see that there is a conflict that they need that it's like their job to fix and is also very sensitive about like being approached with potential ways their behavior is contributing to conflict mm -hmm. and like because it's hard to like go about doing conflict resolution with someone who doesn't think that it's it's even in the of their business to deal with or that right. they're like even needing to participate in the solution at all. Well, my hope is that you would actually have a conversation. They would at least join you in that conversation and be able to say, this is not my, and they say, this is not my problem to solve. And then I, now you have a new issue, right? which is whose responsibility is it to work this? Whose responsibility is it to talk about this? Um, and sometimes people will throw up their hands. And that's one of the things I was encouraging Sarah was appreciating the fact that she doesn't appear to throw up her hands. Some of them may throw up their hands because they don't, they think they are the ones who have to solve it, but it's actually conversations between the two of you that develops the solution for it. Right now, if what you're also saying, Graham, is what do you do when you bring something to somebody and they just go, this, this is not a problem. 
or that that's your problem. You're too, and we've heard it all. You're too sensitive. You're overtired. You're all of those other kinds of things. Um, that's dismissive. Um, and so it's about holding your ground and being assertive and saying, well, actually it is important. And I do want to talk to you about it because we work together on this on, you know, we work together and this is really, this is really being a challenge for me to work with, to figure out and I need your help to figure it out. Okay. And I guess in that scenario, my question would be like, if you are able to like hold your ground, mm -hmm. if the initial conflict is whether or not the other person needs to be engaged in a conflict, then <laughs> Like how it's sort of like how do you deal with the bandwidth of like going through conflict resolution when the first conflict to resolve was whether or not there was a conflict and like how do you deal with like <laughs> that makes sense because it's like you're already That's using awesome. the bandwidth of conflict yes. resolution to establish the fact that right. it needs to take place. Maybe the way to think about it is that the two of you need to get clear about what the question is. Okay. What the issue is. And if they don't want to hear the word conflict. Because, I mean, that can be uncomfortable for folks, right? Um, and it also suggests, you know, they might have all sorts of associations of real negativity when you get into conflict with people, depending on their experience and what they believe. But defining what the issue is, right? So what is it that's important to you in that moment? What is it that you need? Like, I needed this and it didn't happen. And I need okay. it for these reasons. And then sometimes people will then engage around that because the way you're talking about it is this is something that is important to me. This is something I see and I need your help to deal with it. That lands totally differently on people than to say, look, this is our problem and we got to figure it out. Um, I've still used that language, but it depends on the person that I'm working with. And if I'm working with somebody who is uncomfortable in these situations, then I seek to, I seek their help. That's how I talk to them about it. And it's true. I'm seeking their help because I can't figure it out. Does that help? Okay. Yes. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anybody else got anything burning? Because it's after four, so I don't want to keep anybody longer because you've got other things you need to do. Your, your webinars need to go longer than an hour. I just want to put it out there. You are so amazing. I'm, oh, Kim, you're kind. I'm letting you know, you are so amazing. The hour is not enough for you. Thanks, Kim. I agree. Oh, oh, now I'm, ooh, I'm flushing. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You know, that's the first time somebody said an hour is too short. So that's a, uh, that's big, big praise coming. Uh, well, you know what? Good. They do feedback on sessions, right? And they give ideas about what they would like. So y'all, please, if there's something more you want, or you want it done in a different way, Something like, please put that in the feedback because we can work with that. For me, these one hour things, I know I'm just wetting your appetite, you know, putting something out there and say, think about that. Isn't that kind of cool? And if you're interested in that, then we got to find ways to spend more time together to work on a number of different pieces. And I'd be happy to do that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Laura Lee. And yeah, everybody be sure to take the survey. We'll be sending that out tomorrow along with a link to the video. So you can watch it again if you would like. Mm -hmm. um, and be sure to also um, check out Lurley's earlier session from February. It's Conflict Management Part 1, um, more about peers. So um, that wraps up today's professional development uh, series session here. Um, graduate School is uh, thanks all of you for attending. I know a lot of you have uh, attended these events in the past, and we hope to keep seeing you coming around here these Tuesday afternoons. Um, again, we have two more this semester, um, and if you have any ideas for events for future PDS things or any topics that uh, you'd like to learn more about, feel free to uh, share those in the post-event survey as well. So check your email for that tomorrow. Um, thank you one last time to Laura Lee, our, our great speaker here on conflict management, and we will see you all next week. Goodbye, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Have a good rest of your day.